Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jim Skogsberg, President and CEO of Advocate Aurora Health. We appreciate you being here today for another virtual town hall. Based on your feedback, we've shortened the length, but we'll pack in a lot of good information and answer as many of your questions as we can. Last week, we finally received the news many of us who are parents, grandparents, caregivers were waiting for, that the FDA and CDC have approved the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for children five to 11 years of age, finding that it was safe, well-tolerated, and showed a robust antibody response for these younger children. It means that COVID-19 is now a preventable disease for kids ages five and up. But despite that fact, we know there are many parents who are hesitant about vaccinating their children. When it comes to your child's health, you have a lot of questions and rightfully so. You may have gotten the vaccine, but are hesitant about giving it to your child or your grandchild. We understand that. That's why we're here today to have our experts answer your questions and hopefully allay your fears. There is no doubt that our panelists were among the happiest to hear that pediatric vaccines were approved. So let's meet our panelists right now. I wanna welcome Dr. Frank Belmonte, Chief Medical Officer for Advocate Children's Hospital, Dr. Marquita Moore, a pediatrician with Advocate Children's Hospital, and Dr. Kevin Dahlman, Medical Director, Aurora Children's Health. All three have been our go-to pediatric experts throughout the pandemic. I should add that not only are all three pediatricians, but they are also parents, which gives them a unique appreciation for this topic. Thank you so much for being here, folks. Uh, would you mind just taking a, a quick minute to introduce yourself more fully uh, to our uh, audience? Frank, would you start? Sure, I'm Frank Belmonte. As you said, I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Advocate Children's. Did my training at Advocate Children's and got a master's degree in public health at University of Illinois. And I've been back at Advocate for 17 years. 17, very good. Dr. Moore? Marquita Moore, trained at, at um, Advocate Lutheran. I've been a pediatrician for, for over 10 years and I have two boys, five and seven. Very good. Dr. Dahlman. Yes, so my name is Kevin Dahlman, and I practice in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin as a pediatrician and also I serve as medical director of Aurora Children's Health. I'm born and bred in Wisconsin, did my training at Children's Wisconsin, and I have uh, three children, seven, nine, and 10. Very good, thank you all for being here. I know the audience is anxious to hear from you and your point of view and your expertise. Uh, there are, a we all agree, there's a lot of sources of information out there. <laughs> Kind of scary when you think about uh, what, what people rely on for uh, expertise, but uh, when we have experts like Dr. Belmonte, Dr. Moore, Dr. Dahlman, they're going to help you break through the noise and, and bring you the facts. And so before we dive in, just a couple of housekeeping details. First, please submit your questions and comments. They'll come up on uh, my iPad, and we'll get to as many of those as we possibly can in the time available. Second, should we run into technical difficulties, and we certainly don't plan on that, We'll make this video available on our Advocate Aurora Health Facebook page for later viewing. Mm -hmm. And for your convenience, closed captioning is available. Now, let's get to it. Dr. Belmonte, gonna start with you. Um, children ages five to 11 can now get the COVID vaccine. Is the vaccine safe? And how was it determined to be safe? You mind speaking to that? Yes, of course. So we're, we're ab absolutely thrilled by the, uh, the recent announcement last week for that age range. You know, this vaccine, the technology used, the mRNA technology is over, over a decade old. Uh, and we, this was the first large scale uh, use of it. Uh, we now have clinical trials in the adult population, in the 12 to 16 year olds, and over 2000 kids participated in the five to 11 year old trials. Great safety profile across the board. And then I would say the other piece is that we've now vaccinated over a billion people on the planet and we have not seen serious side effects from this vaccine. Yeah, we, we do tend to think a billion uh, test cases is, is pretty good. It's isn't pretty it? good. Now, uh, let me just follow up. Um, my, if I had a, a five-year-old, how many shots? What's the dosage? So it's two vaccines, just like uh, everybody else, separated by three weeks, but it's a third of the dose for kids under age 11. One third under the age 11, thank you. Dr. Dahlman, so often we have heard that children are not as impacted by COVID as adults. Is that the case? And if so, why vaccinate your child? Sure. 
and we hear that question a lot as pediatricians. Uh, but I would like to emphasize here, and I do point out to certainly the parents that are asking me that question, is that certainly we're very grateful, very thankful that most kids, by and large, uh, are spared the severe symptoms of COVID. But not all, and that not all is a real number. We do see hospitalizations in kids adversely affected by the COVID illness. Uh, and furthermore, there are a couple other considerations, and that is we want to keep the kids in school. Last year, for so many kids that were caught virtually in school uh, for school, uh, it had devastating consequences, and we understand how important it is. So by the very act of getting the child fully vaccinated uh, allows us to bypass quarantines uh, in the event of a close contact in school. So we keep the kids in school. And of course, it, we're on the march toward herd immunity. Uh, and that's gonna be critical to, of course, get this population of, uh, of children vaccinated. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Dahlman. Dr. Moore, mm -hmm. the holidays are uh, coming, they're approaching quickly. Yeah. Uh, and so is flu season, as we all know. Uh, and it's also getting a little bit colder. Are these reasons to get your child vaccinated as quickly as possible, yay or nay? Yeah, because right now everybody um, will have more indoor gatherings and then like you will have visiting family members. Everybody wants to see just to, like see each other more now because we've we've missed everybody. Um, and then once we're indoors, then there's higher risk of, of transmitting because most people will be unmasked. And so we want to make sure that they're vaccinated. Very good. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, how can uh, our Advocate Aurora patients schedule a vaccine for their child. Um, Dr. Belmonte? We started last week, last Wednesday, right after the announcement. Uh, there are two ways to schedule. One is you can use the phone number for our COVID vaccine hotline, which is on the screen right now. Uh, you can also use our Live Well app, which is a very easy way to manage the health of you and your family and make an appointment online. Great, thank you. Next question, and we're just gonna we're gonna keep rolling through these questions and and honor all of the, those of you that that submitted them. So, uh, during the early days of the pandemic, Advocate Aurora held large vaccine clinics where people could come to get the shot. We did that in Wisconsin. We did it in Illinois. Uh, why not do that for kids? I know there's a reason, and either. Any of you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I can I can expound on that. So one, we have ample access to the vaccine, very different than early days uh, when we were doing this last year. Secondly, it is really important for the child to feel comfortable, especially young children. So being in a familiar environment is very uh, helpful. And then the, the piece that I think all of us would agree is having that talk with your trusted pediatrician is the way to really allay your fears and help you know that you're making the best decision for your child. Yeah, personal dialogue as opposed to these, these large uh, right. vaccine clinics right. that were referred to. Uh, next question, a recent Kaiser Family Foundation showed a survey showed that only one third of parents say they will get the vaccine for their children immediately. Another third will take a wait and see attitude and still others are saying that they're not going to get vaccines for their kids at all. Does that worry you as pediatricians? And what about this wait and see approach? What do you think? Yeah, you know, and that's a good question. I want to be respectful to honor those concerns or those hesitations that parents have, um, but we welcome those conversations as primary care doctors. So I would encourage those parents to have an honest dialogue with pediatricians, family medicine doctors, and of course, do the research on your own, but from reliable resources that are mm -hmm. coming from your child's doctor. It's really paramount that we do uh, have that conversation because this is a very important vaccine when we've been through what we've been through the last 18 months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Moore, have you had uh, parents in your office in the last week or so mm -hmm. say, hey, I'm going to wait and see? And if so, what did you say to them when you were face to face with them? So I have had some that are very eager and some that are waiting. Um, and with the waiting, I can. So first, you have to listen first just to see where they're coming from and if there's any fear. Um, and then secondly, I just try to like tell them what I know, which is from the things you know that I've read from scientific sources that the side effects from the five to, to like 11 are mainly just the injection site pain and fatigue and maybe and, and maybe fever. So they don't have any serious side effects from it. And right now, COVID is still transmitting through kids. There's like 8,300 that were hospitalized with like a third in the ICU. So it's still like a serious thing with yeah. this population. Yeah. So if so if you're here in the wait and see, you're trying to talk them out of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. Uh, next question. Uh, and this one's come up frequently so far. Should I get my 11 year old son the vaccine now or should I wait until early January when he turns 12? Because I think he'll get a 
triple dose compared to the uh, smaller dose for the 11 year old. He's never had COVID, please advise. What are you telling that parent? So certainly this discussion has come up even among us, um, you know, minutes ago. And we are hearing that this scenario um, is quite rampant. So mm -hmm. um, we've heard from our patients and our parents saying, hey, when can we get um, our child vaccinated? What should we do if they're 11? Our recommendation is we, we really don't want to see that delay. So we do encourage 11 year olds to receive the vaccine in a timely manner. And in fact, if that's before they turn 12, great. But then, of course, that three week window, if they have turned 12 since, they would get a full size adult dose for that three week second booster. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. For understandable reasons, there has been vaccine hesitancy in communities of color. What is your message to parents who share that hesitancy, particularly when it comes to their kids? You've all probably had that in your office. Dr. Moore? Yeah, so that is a very common and a natural and an understanding, you know, um, thought process. Um, but I just tell them that they have to trust who their physician is. Uh, first of all, because if they have one that they don't trust, then that would be problem number one, that they need to talk to somebody who they actually trust. And, and then also, I will also mention that from my standpoint with my kids, that they are vaccinated. And I tell them that they didn't have any side effects in the first 24 hours or, or in the first uh, 48 hours, actually. Um, and I also tell them that the vaccine wasn't made overnight. Like the technology has right. been over decades and the coronavirus has been studied over decades also. Yeah, and, and you've made that point, uh, Dr. Belmonte, you made that point in some earlier comments, but it bears repeating. Some people think this is somehow rushed and experimental. And as you pointed out, not only are there a billion doses, but this has been studied and utilized for over a decade. And, so, we, and we've done clinical trials just like we do for every other medication. Right. I mean, I would just add to Dr. Moore's that also people, communities of color are highly affected by getting COVID. Those are the kids that we've seen get the sickest in our ICUs. So that population is very important to protect. Very good, thank you. Next question. My child is going through cancer treatment and is high risk. Can you explain why it is so important that children be vaccinated to protect the most vulnerable children? Here, I think this is a parent that wants to protect her child because her child has cancer. Uh, comments about that? So I would just say that, you know, we've seen immune compromised populations that don't mount a sufficient response, which is why the herd immunity that uh, Dr. Dahlman spoke to is so important. If everybody gets vaccinated, then we protect the most vulnerable in our, in our society including yeah. kids with cancer or other immune conditions. Right. There's a little bit of look out for your neighbor and, right. mm -hmm. and uh, the greater good kind of uh, discussion that we've all been involved in for these last nearly two years. Um, some questions are a little bit repetitive, but I want to honor the people that put them forward. So was this vaccine rushed? We just talked about it, but I'll give you a chance to... Uh, what do you say, Docs? Point blank, no, it was not rushed. Uh, was there put thought behind it? Yes. Uh, it was it expedited, uh, absolutely, um, but in a very responsible and safe manner. Uh, and then of course, the, it received the FDA's emergency <coughs> use authorization. That is not full authorization, but that should not be misconstrued as somehow rushed or irresponsible. Uh, of course, there has to be milestones met and the proof has to be there for safety and efficacy, which has been fully established. When we reach adequate numbers, I fully anticipate in a matter of time, it will be uh, you know, authorized without the emergency use part of it. If my child is vaccinated, do I put him or her at risk for infertility? It's that same kind of uh, argument that's, that we've had for, again, the last 20 months or so that it, this causes uh, infertility. Uh, care to comment? They had studies that were done this year. Some of that data was um, released in August of 2021, where it showed that about 2,000 or 3,000 women received COVID vaccination, and they did not have any increased risk of, of miscarriage. And this is within the first 20 weeks of, of pregnancy. Right. And I think that's the reason the American College of Obstetrics mm -hmm. and Gynecology endorse uh, pregnant women getting uh, the vaccine. And, or if you're and breastfeeding women. Too. Right, and breastfeeding, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, next question, my will my child develop myocardiology or other heart problems from the vaccine? So, uh, do you wanna go? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we all wanna jump in on this one. <laughs> so the, we have seen kids, so there, there are, are some kids, especially in boys, that can have a mild myocarditis. It's very rare with the vaccine. Uh, we, have had, we have treated some of these kids at Advocate Children's. 
Um, it is a mild thing. They don't require any major follow-up or medications. The risk of myocarditis from contracting COVID is actually mm -hmm. much higher than the risk of getting it from the vaccine, and it's usually a much more serious uh, risk, a more, a more serious case. Okay. Now, you just mentioned mild, uh, so let me take the next question. <clears throat> Why vaccinate children since if they get COVID, it's going to be mild and they easily fight it off. Now you've talked about hospitalizations and intensive care units for kids and so on. So why don't we, why don't we uh, respond to that directly? Well, I'll be quick to say here that it's paramount, again, to keep the kids in school. It's absolutely critical. We know that in-person learning is instrumental for good mental health and, of course, their academic careers and success. Uh, so that's a practical consideration. But, of course, uh, with the uh, unvaccinated group, um, that's going to lead to more infections. And of course, it's not as if this population lives in a bubble. Uh, we're part of a community and the kids come home to parents and grandparents and they're around aunts and uncles and we have holidays coming up here. So of course, that we are concerned that the kids are going to bring it home to them and uh, infect others. So it's an important consideration on why the children should be vaccinated. Uh, and, and you mentioned uh, with, with holidays coming up. So here's the next question. We've already all had COVID in our home. Why do we need to worry about it now? It's that notion of somehow I'm, I've got full immunity uh, because- So the natural yeah. immunity question. Yeah. So there is a uh, natural immunity, but they don't know how, how efficient that it is and how long that it lasts. But they have better, uh, better chances if they have hybrid immunity, which is if they had the COVID vaccine, I mean, the, the, the COVID um, infection and at least been uh, like been vaccinated. Those two have a greater antibody uh, production. And so they have a higher, um, what am I trying to say? Kind of double higher protection. immunity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Higher no. immunity yeah. with the vaccination and with the COVID, you know, infection. Sure. So sure. you still want to be vaccinated. Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> next question. Um, does the vaccine alter my child's <laughs> DNA? Again, you know, we read these things. We, we hear these things. So let's put it to rest, <clears throat> shall we? So the vaccine uses messenger RNA technology, which is basically a blueprint. So it sends the blueprint into your cell. Your cell then produces the protein that is the antibody that fights the infection. The RNA does not alter, it does not enter the nucleus of the cell. It is literally just the blueprint to teach your body how to build its own immunity. So it's, it, that, that's completely debunked. Right, uh, no, no DNA um, problems with, uh, with this vaccine. Uh, I've heard many children have had serious allergic reactions to the vaccine, true or false? We haven't seen it. The evidence hasn't bared it out. Thankfully, uh, we've seen this in a very rare occurrence, uh, along with the side effect profile being very mild. So we're very blessed to be able to see that kids are tolerating this vaccine well with minimal side effects, including the uh, severe allergic reactions that uh, is a little bit more prevalent in adults, uh, but still very rare. Very good. Uh, we are seeing unprecedented high volumes of respiratory problems in children across Chicagoland. I presume, Kevin, you'll talk about uh, what's happening in Wisconsin. Many have been hospitalized. How important will the flu shot be this season? Can, get, can kids get both the COVID vaccine and the flu vaccine at the same time? You can speak to the Chicagoland area. <laughs> Go okay. for it. So they can get both, both vaccines at the same time. And right now it is flu season. Flu's, and flu is, flu is not gonna stop because COVID is here. And COVID isn't gonna stop because flu is here. So with COVID by like itself, it was, as I said earlier, about 8,300 hospital stays with like one third being in the ICU. And that matches the pre-pandemic flu, uh, uh, flu season numbers. So if we have both of those numbers and they're both rushing into the hospital, that's gonna be a very devastating picture. So you would recommend, <laughs> hey, get the flu shot and get the get vaccine, mm -hmm. and it's okay to get it at the same time, right? It is safe. Correct. Got mm -hmm. it. Got it. And Thank parents you. should get What's it, going? too, the flu vaccine. And parents should get it, too. Yes. All right. Very good. Thank you. Um, let's see. Next question. Does the availability of the vaccine prompt a good reason to schedule an appointment for my child's other health and wellness checks at the same time? Can I, can I sort of double up, come in and get the vaccine and also do a well check, et cetera? 
A resounding yes. <laughs> we are eager to uh, keep up with those well child uh, examinations. It's really important for us to keep that developmental radar uh, going so that we're picking up on anything that needs to be addressed for the child, uh, assessing normal growth and development, of course. And then, yes, we um, are able to administer the routine vaccinations alongside the flu vaccine, alongside the COVID vaccine. So all of those can be given together very safely without any adverse effects. Thank that, you. I would, I would yeah. just say that was a, that's another reason to have it integrated into, into our primary care network, mm -hmm. because then we can really treat the whole child at the visit, whether they need other vaccines, a physical and their COVID shot, right. we can do it all at once. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Are unvaccinated children more likely to spread COVID? So how does it get spread? Vaccinated, unvaccinated? Who wants to speak to that? Yes, yes, they are, um, because unvaccinated people have a higher risk of catching COVID. And even if it's mild, that doesn't mean that it's a decreased viral load that they can transmit. That viral load is still like the same, whether it's a mild infection or a moderate or a severe infection. So they can definitely tra trans uh, transmit it within schools and at home. Yeah, so, so thank you for that, Dr. Moore. So we're, we're all still hearing uh, comments like, well, whether you're vaccinated or not, you can still spread the disease, why bother? And what we're saying is, no, 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 that's, that's not exactly the truth. Um, it's much more likely to spread if you're unvaccinated. And right? remember the great majority of hospitalizations we're seeing now and ICU stays are in the unvaccinated population. Right. So the, the vaccinated folks who have been, uh, who get breakthrough infection, most are mild cases, they're at home, they don't need uh, any kind of medical intervention, so. It right. does help a lot. Yep, yep, thank you. Uh, let me see, next question. Recent national data suggests that we are not seeing all eligible teens getting the vaccine. Is that the case and what are we seeing locally? What's been the experience around teens who have been able to get vaccinated now for quite some time? Um, we're talking about 13 and, and above or 12 and above. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you seeing in your office um, any phenomena that you can report? I can speak to the state of Illinois. We're about a 43 to 46% compliance in that age range compared to the general population, high 50s. Mm -hmm. So it is certainly less, and a lot of it gets back to what Dr. Mm -hmm. Moore and Dr. Dolan said about the vaccine hesitancy. So we're really trying to get out to that population as well now to debunk the myths, help them understand, and hopefully get their kids vaccinated. Kevin, any comments about Wisconsin? We're seeing very similar rates, actually, than uh, you know we are in Illinois. So in Wisconsin, we're seeing about high 40s uh, for percentage of teens uh, that are vaccinated mm -hmm. uh, and just behind, but catching up, I would hope and expect to the adult population. And I would anticipate the same to be true for the five through 11 population that now can be uh, now they could be vaccinated. I would add that the most compelling reason that I found for teenage athletes is that mm -hmm. if you want to stay in your sport um, and not be quarantined and miss competition, this is a great way to do so. It'll of course keep you healthy and safe, but it'll also prevent quarantines when you reach that state competition. Yep, thank you, thank you. Um, similar, uh, I think we've talked about it again, but, but let's honor the question. What side effects should I look for if my child gets the vaccine? So what am I looking out for as a parent? So for the five to like 11, it's mostly the pain at the injection site, um, fever and fatigue and possibly headaches too. And that kind of mimics the 16, through, I mean the 12 to like 16 age range. Got it. Thank it's you. been interesting in the last week with the rollout, mm -hmm. we are not seeing the same number of side effects that we saw in even the older kids. Mm -hmm. And part of it is probably related to the third of the dose. Um, and just, I don't know, maybe the younger kids are just more resilient. Yeah. <laughs> They're not complaining as much. I would agree, you know, yeah. and, I, and I think that mm -hmm. um, in addition, it, it also mimics that if you were to get the COVID illness, it is less severe uh, as far as symptomatic right. in kids. So mm -hmm. I would suspect the same is true because of the vaccine as well. We're seeing that. So here's a good question. I've got multiple kids in my family. So for parents with children under the age five, how do you protect these little ones who can't be vaccinated um, you know, with their big brother, big sister, that kind of thing. So how do you protect the, the younger ones? Certainly is a challenge, especially when there's uh, more respiratory illness in daycares. Thankfully, uh, just uh, like we had applied from five to 11 year olds, we're also seeing younger kids uh, not getting a severe COVID. Uh, so that in, for, in fact, when we're seeing our, uh, the daycare kids in our, in our uh, clinics, um, you know, if you're really sick, uh, our suspicion for COVID is lower. We still test, uh, but it's really the mild illnesses, the sore throat, the runny nose, and that's uh, the population that we're seeing is, hmm, this could be COVID, and quite a few of those kids are. Uh, but to answer your question, 
directly, how do you protect that younger age group? Well, of course, you know, if you have a five to 11 year old, they're gonna be bringing respiratory illness home. The perfect way to protect them, younger kids, of course, is get everybody else in the family vaccinated. It's really critical and key. We do recommend masking down to two years of, uh, of age. Uh, the younger you go, the less likely it is for the mask to be properly worn. We understand that, but every little layer of protection is helpful. So we always think about stacking different layers of protection. Social distancing and masking has always been key. Uh, Two-year-olds don't necessarily understand that, uh, but we do what we can do to keep them healthy and safe. So along those lines, what are you hearing or reading about uh, the next future vaccine that takes us down to three or down to two or newborns or what, what's, what's around the corner for young, younger kids? There, there's two cohorts being studied right now. So the two to five-year-olds, which most likely will be the next group that will go probably sometime after the first of the year, and then they're studying it down to six months of age. So eventually this vaccine probably will be safe from six months all the way up through adulthood. Next question, um, and I, I appreciate where this is coming from. Is my unvaccinated child really at risk if everyone else around him is vaccinated? So do I really have to if everybody in the room is vaccinated? So how do you respond to that? What would you say to this parent? I would say yes, that that child is at uh, like at risk because you don't know what would happen if they did catch COVID. You don't know if it would be like a mild case or a severe case or even miss C's to, to like where they're hospitalized for it. And then also they're still bringing it back home. So you don't know if they would bring home this COVID strand that has mutated to a superhero and then came home and could have knocked you guys out too. So it's very important to have everybody vaccinated. Yeah, and we still know the vaccinated can pass on the, the uh, infection. So, um, so here's one that's come up multiple times. My child hates shots. We're talking to the experts. Any tips for how to get your child to be, I guess, a little bit more comfortable with those needles? Talking bribery? No. <laughs> um, I mean, you have to be honest. You have to kids, be honest. Right? Like it, it is going to be a little bit of a pinch. Yep. I think, you it's know, quick. I, I, I think this is, uh, to <clears throat> quote one of my colleagues, vaccines are our jam. I mean, in pediatrics, this is what we do. Pediatric nurses, MAs, mm -hmm. we know how to calm the child down. We know how to do it quickly. We know how to do it as pain free as possible. But you got to be honest. You know, you, your talk to you, him, you're, mm -hmm. you are going to get a shot today. Um, it's going to be a little pinch and it's gonna be over real quick, mm -hmm. and that's it. You know, and most kids are really resilient they with are. this stuff. They yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I know we're running out of time. Let me get to a couple more questions if I can. Um, if my child has exposure to another student in school with COVID, my child is symptom-free and wears a mask in school, do they need to wait a period of time to receive the COVID vaccine? So I just, my child just got exposed, now, uh, do I wait to get the vaccine or do I rush in and get the vaccine? So with school exposure, it's going to be about a 10 day wait or actually if they get tested on day five with the with the PCR and is negative, then the quarantine is shortened to about seven days. So then they can become vaccinated. OK, so there is a sort of a waiting period if you've been exposed. If you've been exposed. Yeah. You don't, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, what about families that have a history of allergies to eggs or adverse reactions to previous vaccines? Are there certain conditions that would warrant an exemption? Well, one, egg is not involved in the production of this vaccine, so that's not a, a concern at all. And as Kevin said, there's not really a lot of allergens that we're seeing with this particular vaccine. I mean, we have not, we've done, you know, thousands and thousands of this vaccine at, uh, at Advocate Aurora. We have not seen major allergic reactions. But I would add here that, um, you know, if your child does have a medical condition and you think it would um, be problematic with an abnormal immune system or a known heart condition, talk to your child's uh, pediatrician, family medicine doctor or specialist. Uh, because there are a few contraindications to this COVID vaccine that you would want to be sure that it's appropriate to move ahead. So how many vaccines do you give little kids when you think about mumps and rubella? And are, are, there, are there four standard? Are there seven standard? What, how many vaccines do you typically give a, a, a child? Well, at two, four, and six months, they are getting three vaccines. Um, and then at about four years old, they're going to get two. And these are still like the same things where it's whooping cough, tetanus, right. polio, 
measles. So, so here's where this question is going. All those, all those vaccines, can I get them all at the same time or do I need to stagger them? Now we already talked about get your flu shot and get your COVID shot, but can I get those others as well? Or would you stagger them or, or, or how would you handle that? It depends upon what is missing. So if it's a fair like amount that is missing, then I would do the, the most relevant ones now, which would be flu and COVID vaccine, and then add on one of the childhood ones and just do three at Got a time. It. Got it. I would just add to that, because this question comes to pediatricians all the time, like how many is too many? So on right. a daily basis, your child is presented with millions yes. of antigens in their environment, and their immune system is fighting them off. So saying that you're gonna get five shots or four shots or three shots, mm -hmm. it's really a drop in the bucket to yeah. what your immune system is used to doing every day. Right. So I wouldn't, that's not, that should not be a fear. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, very good. And we're gonna have to end on that. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, I wanna thank all of you um, for the great questions that you've submitted. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. We've tried to stay to that 30, that 30 minute uh, time frame. I also wanna thank Drs. Belmonte, Moore, and Dahlman for sharing their time and insights with us today. We greatly appreciate your wealth of knowledge and uh, your willingness to share it. Uh, folks, you can find all the latest COVID-19 vaccine information at our website at aah.org slash vaccine. That's aah.org backslash vaccine. I also recommend you download our LiveWell app where you can make a vaccine appointment for your child or for yourself and get all your health information in one convenient place. One more ask, your feedback is important to us and we wanna hear from you. Please take two minutes to fill out the survey. Finally, thanks for watching and thank you for your trust and confidence in Advocate Aurora Health. Until next time, stay safe.